One man is being victimized by our own government. One man who they fear, yet who millions love. One man who is willing to take the poison arrows of lawfare. One man whose voice has been taken away by a corrupt judge operating in a corrupt system. One man who has been ridiculed and insulted. One man who refused to back down. One man who refused to back down. One man who refused to back down. One man who stands between us and them. One man that wants to see America protected again. One man who wants to see America prosper again. One man who understands that a man is a man and a woman is a woman. One man who understands and protects the blessing of life. One man who wants to restore American exceptionalism. One man who once again wants to make America that shining city on a hill for all to see. A place where all the people of the world glowingly set their eyes upon. America. One man who unashamedly wants to make America great again. That one man is Donald Trump. Is fanfare with Barry Cunningham. Over the weekend, the past Secretary couple- of Labor Julie Sue has been terrific. She's knocking, knocking down doors. She's trying to stop this. She's trying to get us to a media where we can have a fair negotiations. It's the companies that don't want to. They don't want to sit here and be fair. So that's why we're out here fighting for our livelihood. What more from the automation do you want? What more protections could there be? What more? Yeah, they have language in there now. Not strong enough, because what happens is they come in with new technology. We just caught them in Mobile, Alabama, called AutoGate. And that means the trucks are coming in, and they're already checked in somewhere else and not using the checkers in the ILA. Circumventing the contract. Circumventing the contract. They don't care. They don't care. It's not fair. And if we don't put our foot down now, they would like to run over us. And we're... So this is the guy who's the uh, head of the Longshoremen's Union, and he's the guy who makes 900000 bucks a year, he's got a big, nice 75-foot boat, uh, has a Bentley, and he's like, it's not fair, it's not fair, we need to deserve more. I don't know who to side with here. It's it's a very weird situation. Everything that's happened at this point, this entire strike, the timing of it, how much they've turned down, how much they still want, it's it's crazy every other person in america right now if you said i was going to give you a 40 percent raise they'd probably go yeah i'm down with that give me give me a 40 percent raise these guys want a 70 percent raise they almost want to be partners in the dock basically hey if you can get it you can get it but at this point, the timing of this and timing of how they're putting America in, a, in this kind of a situation, they don't see it that way. Listen, listen to what this guy says. He doesn't see it that he's the one putting America in any type of situation. Not going to allow that. You are going to grind the economy to a halt here on the East Coast and the no, Gulf no, Coast. No, 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 not us. They are. Don't spin it now because you're Fox News. <laughs> Typical. Okay, so there, there. Just I wanted you guys to hear that because there were some people posting that this guy is a friend of Trump, and because of him and Trump, they're working behind the scenes. Now this guy just gave himself away. He doesn't like Fox. Oh, you're from Fox News. You're fake. 
I don't know if he's friends with Trump, but this guy seems to be a full-on liberal at this point. They're going to drive it. Why are you worried? They're going to drive it. Are you worried that this they strike... They have the capital to settle this thing. Are you worried that this strike is going to hurt the everyday American, the farmers that need to reach the, reach the export market? They're Listen, telling me that they're going to hurt through all of this. Now you start to realize who the longshoremen are, right? Nobody cares People about never people. gave a about us until now, when they finally realized that the chain is being broke now. I, I hate to be the one to break it to him, but if you're looking for acceptance and people caring about you, perhaps putting something in front of their faces where they may not be able to feed their family isn't the best way to plead your case. Yeah, I understand you've had time to renegotiate this. I understand that, that there's all kinds of things that maybe you should have done, would have done differently, and that you want to at this point seize on the moment. But I doubt you're going to get many people who, you know, are going to get behind you on this. Cars won't come in. Food won't come in. Clothing won't come in. You know how many people depend on our jobs? Half the world. And it's time for them and time for Washington to put so much pressure on them to take care of us. Because we took care of them and we're here 135 years. And So I have a question. As you see the title here, what government has America been completely sold out by our so-called leadership. And below that, you must understand, no one is coming to help you in an emergency. Regardless of which side is the one with the problem at this point, do you think maybe the government, meaning Dementia Joe, Kamala, may have thought to themselves, we should probably take care of this thing before it goes too much, much further. We have an election, you got the holidays, all this stuff is coming up, and uh, you're not doing anything? And now you're faced with having to deal with this guy? Brought them where they are today, and they don't want to share! <laughs> Keyword. Keyword he just said. He didn't say, I need to get paid, we need to, to get paid what we're worth. That was, the, that was the word that told me who this guy really is. See, anyone who's telling you that they might be, you know, maggots, and they're trying to basically tr do this to cause problems at the ele election, he just said, I want my share. That doesn't mean you know, in, in any way, shape, or form that you are somebody at this point who wants what you're worth. See, it's a little bit different. We all, we all have an idea of what our personal self-worth is. If you go to work and you make 10, 15, 20 bucks an hour and you'd like to make more, you need to show more value. You don't go to the company and go, wait a second, man. Your company just made a million bucks. You need to share that with me. That's what he just said. He didn't say, my guys deserve this much because they work so many hours per week. They unload so many containers. He said, share. Our government may be facilitating this. Think about that for a second. Who's, the, who, who's out there saying fair share? Who's out there saying equity? Not Trump. Fox Business' Lydia Hu joins us now from the port of Newark in New Jersey. And I've been following you. We have been, uh, as you've done this story for us. And now the rubber has met the road. And he feels like he's dug in and feels like he's in a strong position. Is he in as strong a position as he thinks or appears to seem to be? You know, he certainly feels like he's in a strong position. And he's probably looking... If I were him and I was the type of guy that would hold people over a barrel like that, I'd feel like I was in a very strong position as well. You see, these people must have been planning this for quite some time. You have to think about that as well. In order for them to bank as much money to make sure that their people wouldn't be harmed, they had to have been setting up some sort of fund making sure that, hey, listen, we know that if Jimmy can only, you know, stay out of work for three weeks, we need to be able to take care of Jimmy. And so there's probably people there that are that, that have basically created a fund at this point to make sure that all these people, these 45,000 people are taken care of. They've been banking money. I'd love to see the balance sheet of the, of the union. 
How much cash do they have on hand? Who gave them the cash that they have on hand? See, if I was a reporter, I'd be digging that. Hey, we need to get into this balance sheet of this union. Find out what you know kind of flow has come in or, or going out. You know, when I first heard, and, and, and it, it was amazing to me, but when I first heard that Kamala Harris had raised $600 million, and I'm thinking to myself, where is that money going? You can't possibly buy that much advertising. You just can't do it. You can't hire that many lawyers to engage in lawfare. Where are you sending money? How are you spending six? Hundred plus million. She just was at it. San Francisco raised another fifty-five million dollars. I'm not going to point any fingers, but I'm pretty sure if somebody wanted to bankroll a strike to make sure that the union members were taken care of, even though they're on strike and crippling the country, could we be looking at another movie here? I'm just saying. Something doesn't, doesn't seem right here. Nothing, no, something. Nothing seems right about this. And we don't see the government really seeming to give a crap at all. Around at other unions and the wage gains and the record contracts that they have notched in recent years. I mean, just last year, the West Coast port workers got a, a new contract with a 32% wage hike over four years. So, so they got a 32% wage hike over four years. So that's going to be an average of 8% increase in income over the next four years. 8% every single year. But here's what she says, and, and this, is, <laughs> this is why I keep going, I don't know what's going on. Now, Mr. Daggett, the president is looking at that and saying, we want that and better. Just yesterday, Dana, Mr. Daggett rejected port management's offer of a 50% wage hike. Hey, Johnny, I'm going to pay you 50% more than what you're paying right now, and you have the ability... You're, you're negotiating for higher pay and you're telling me you have the ability to turn down a 50% raise? So just for, for math, you're making 50 grand a year. And you're like, you know, listen, I'd, I'd like to get another couple hundred bucks a week. And your boss comes to you and says, you know what? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to add you another 25 grand. So you're going to go from 50 to 75, a 50% raise. Nope. Nah, don't want it said who over eight years just to give you an idea of where they stand right now it does seem like the two sides are still far apart but he does at least i have to say david i can't see this strike lasting a month without the president stepping in because really we're being held hostage and the president is supporting a union which is conducting a damaging strike okay you heard those words the president and kamala are supporting the union so they, they, they're behind the longshoremen. That's when I started looking and go, hey, man, something ain't right here. You're supporting the union against, I guess, the port owners. Down here, I thought the government actually owned the port. Are you, are you trying to get more money out of the boat owners? I don't know. But the government is causing the actual strike. Think about that. When he said, I'm not going to negotiate, he's making sure that the strike continues. He's the one who's fueling it. He and Kamala and whoever else behind the scenes, they're the ones who are telling him, we're not going to negotiate. So if you don't negotiate, that means the strike continues. How long is he willing to do this? Stuart Varney just said a month. What happens in a month? An election. Oh, that's right. He'll have to step in at some point. That's just my opinion. What say you? Stuart, I, I got to disagree with you. Uh, I, I've watched a lot of these interviews by these individuals at, at, at these at these ports. They are upset. How did we get here? Stuart, we got here because the money supply was increased by 30 percent. You had a Biden administration that spent bills called the Inflation Reduction Act that did the opposite. You have deficit spending in the trillions of dollars. They've crushed middle class families. These families are hurting, Stuart. 
I think they will drag this out as long as they need to to send a message. So I, I am concerned. I actually disagree. I think this could go on a lot longer than most people realize. All right. Well, we shall see. David, thanks for joining us this morning. Big day for you. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Stuart. I've also been talking to the members here on the ground, the individuals here that are now taking to the picket line. They tell me one of their top concerns, inflation, that we have all been living under for the past four years. They say that their wages are not adequately keeping up with the cost of living increase and that they... So some of these guys make, just so you know, $300,000 a year, somebody told me. The guys who run the cranes that pick stuff up and pick and put them down. And they're 300 grand a year, but my wage isn't, you know, inflation's just too much. Gas prices are too much. You make 300 grand a year, you're okay. People are starving. People are hungry. And you're complaining because, you know, 300 grand, I can't get it done. Need these wage increases reflected in their next contract so they can just keep up and get... Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo did... A now you're going to love this one. ...an interview yesterday, but not as Commerce Secretary. She appeared as a Kamala Harris campaign surrogate hours before the strike began. Where have you been kind of focused and hearing on what would happen if the strike goes, let's say, longer than a week? Uh... Again, I, I have not been very focused on that. I would refer you to uh, the White House or the tra um, Transportation Secretary. Refer you to the White House? <laughs> I mean, that's where Kamala Harris is working now. As that's her job. Her job as the Commerce Secretary is to make sure commerce keeps moving. And she looked in the camera on CNBC and said, yeah, I haven't really been focusing on it. What? Is our government completely inept? I haven't even been focused on it. Well, what the hell have you been focused on? The ports across the eastern seaboard and up the Gulf are shut down. People can't get goods. And you're the person in charge of goods being bought and sold. And you just told America, yeah, sorry, I've been, I've been busy. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. Sorry. <laughs> I ain't focused on that. Hey, what is she talking <laughs> For about? For a split second, she was going to say I refer you to the Commerce Secretary, but oh, hold on, wait a minute. That's me. I, I you know, I, I posted on uh, X yesterday I, that it's been a tight, tight race for the most incompetent person in this administration, but in the last two weeks, I feel like uh, that she has kind of taken the lead over maybe Pothole Pete. It's, it's really, uh, it's, a, it's an embarrassment. This is her job. But it's dangerous. Of course it's dangerous. It's, and it gets back to what I said in the very beginning of our conversation. There's never been a focus on economics. There's never been a focus on commerce. Everything has been a focus on their agenda from day one. And there's a massive indifference to Americans. So the question which Charles began to talk about, what is the agenda? If they're not here to basically look at the economy and make sure everything is flowing correctly, what exactly is the agenda? Because you're not looking to facilitate success and prosperity throughout America. Excuse me. You're not doing that. In fact, you're doing just the opposite. You're doing everything you possibly can to make sure Americans suffer. And now you've basically gone a, a step further and you, you're working with these longshoremen, and you're not helping to negotiate, and your, sec your commerce secretary looks in a camera and says, I'm not really focused on it. What else is she focused on? What else is so important that the commerce secretary of America, of the United States, is not working on commerce? That's why I put on there, your government's not coming to save you. They're not coming to help you. They are working aggressively, not just working against you. They are working aggressively against you. You need to be ready, but more so, you need to recognize it first. You need to see this for what it really is, the evil that is really going on. It's, it's incredible. All right, so it's 5.53. Trump is supposed to speak at six o'clock. So here's what I found out since the last time we got together, which was all of about 45 minutes ago. So I don't know if it was Secret Service or what,
but he was supposed to have a speech slash rally or whatever. From now, what I understand is they've changed this from a speech to a press conference. I, I don't know what's going on. There, there's, the information was quite sparse. Not really sure what what exactly it is. So when he comes up up to the podium, because it's not it's not like a big stage. When he comes up to the podium, we'll understand what exactly this is going to be that transpires. Not really sure. So I know that you know he's he's coming up shortly. They're saying he should be up in five minutes. So I don't want to get into the second part of what I was going to talk about because it's going to take a lot longer. So instead, I'll just talk to you guys and and we'll we'll see what we can. Figure out together here. Um, God bless you, Trump. God bless, bless us, please. Yeah. Oh, and um, once he, just to let you know, I told some people that I'd have the the link to be able to register for the free gift certificates tonight that we're going to give away. I haven't had a chance because everything was happening so fast. So what I'm going to do is when he starts talking, I'm going to put him on full screen. And when I put him on full screen in the background here, I'll be a busy bee trying to get some stuff done. And then once that's done, I'll go ahead and post accordingly so you guys can see and begin entering. In any event, at 8 o'clock, we'll be able to get that done. Uh, hey, Marcus, yeah, extreme panic mode is what the Democrats are in. Extreme. I, I should should I get into the uh, stick around after he's done talking. I don't think it's going to be a long talk. I'm, I want to talk to you about what's going on in North Carolina. There there is some stuff happening in North Carolina that will just completely blow you away. Um, there's let me see if I can find this one uh, message because it's it's really awful. Um, hold on, let me find it. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. one second, because I uh, was going to wait, but, all right, so, how's your day going? Good, my day's going good too, so, busy, but good, all right, um, where is this? This is, this is downright frightening when you read this, okay, found it, I want to show you this, and it's going to piss you off. It's going to absolutely piss you off. So, those of you who may not know, there used to be a fort called Fort Bragg. I'm still going to refer to it as Fort Bragg because I'm not playing this woke game that they're talking about. But, um, <laughs> watch this or read this. Um, the 82nd Airborne should just take off from Bragg right now and go save the people of Asheville. Trump will pardon them all on day one and give them a parade. So what, what exactly is he talking about? So here's this message, and it says, if you're going to post this, leave out my info, please. So somebody had to delete who I posted it. Read this. I'm in the 82nd station in Fayetteville, 82nd Airborne. We have guys in our unit with family in Western North Carolina that are trying to get to their family, guys who are asking to put in passes to go help any way they can. They're all getting told no. Meanwhile, we got briefed that we have to be on standby in case we need to go support what's going on in the Middle East. The people stuck need to know that we're trying, but our higher-ups aren't allowing it. You, you, you can go ahead and dwell on that for a second. That the 82nd Airborne, located right in Fort Bragg. Fort Bragg is in Fayetteville. Fayetteville, North Carolina. They could probably be there in, in less than an hour, up until where they're really needed. They can helicopter in. They can do all kinds of different things. It's the 82nd Airborne. And their, their, their leaders, their up-abovers, are telling them, nope, can't go. Might have to send you over there. But, but my, my family's right here, and we can go help them. Sorry. Stand down, sir. Stand down. You can't go. I'd, I'd be an AWOL, AWOL crazy person right there. Um, my brother was there. He's 83rd. Yeah. Oh, dear Lord, have mercy. <laughs> I, I, could, I could not imagine having seen what happened to 
the people in Asheville, and I'm in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and my superior commanding officer is saying, stand down, you're not going. You'd be looking at the backside of my ass. Go ahead. <laughs> Court martial me. I don't care. This ain't worth it. At, at some point, people have to stop following orders and do what's right. I know it may mean people's livelihoods. I understand that fully. I know it's a very hard thing, but damn, these people are from the mountains. Many of them have relatives right there. They're in friggin' Fayetteville. And our commander in chief and his minions aren't letting our guys go help. That's why I put on the, the, the little thing there. Our government isn't helping us. Uh, yeah, Tennessee is already deployed. Yeah, the, this evil regime cares for no American at all. Evil, evil is in the White House. Pray for the people who, who have gone through hurricanes and now dealing with the inept government. And, and we keep saying it over and over. Are they incompetent? No. They're not incompetent. And, and at this point, I'm going to tell you, they are not inept either. They're not inept. They know exactly what they're doing. They have an evil, nefarious, devious plan for America, and they are executing it. They are making sure that they do exactly what they need to do to take this country down. There's nothing stupid about it. Yeah, they got Dementia Joe on a string, and they got Kamala Harris on some other strings. But the people up top who are pulling these strings, they know exactly what they're doing. There's no stupidity about it at all. People have to stop saying that, in including Trump. Stop saying these people are stupid because they're executing a devious plan. Maybe Kamala's stupid, maybe Dementia Joe's an idiot, but the people who are actually doing this, they know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what they want out of us. Um, oh my God, they need to get their stuff together. Other countries are watching this guy. <laughs> Gong show and might get us where we're vulnerable. Kind of scary if you ask me. That's what they want. They want us to be in a war. See, I'm glad you picked up on that. Think about what that soldier just said. What that soldier just said here <laughs> is, and, and you can look at it again. They're all. <laughs> Meanwhile, we got briefed that we may have to be on standby in case we need to support the Middle East. Oh, so we're going to go fight against Iran. Did you, did you catch that? So we're, we're, we're going to send our troops to go over there and fight with Israel against Iran. So what happens when that first American gets uh, shot? We're in the war. We are now in the war. And what happens when an American takes out an Iranian. And China goes, hey, I got to deal with Iran, so now we got to do some stuff to you. Or Putin goes, hey, I'm working with Iran, now we got to do some stuff to you. This could happen and escalate very, very fast. It is a nightmare scenario. Those nuts over there in some of these countries don't care. My God, I remember. I don't remember what book it was I read, or was it a movie? It said that the greatest deterrent in war was that the other guy could annihilate you. That a, a, a push of a button, could you could lose a city. So it kept you from going too far because you don't want to be that stupid. You don't want you don't want to have a hundred thousand people get Nagasaki into non-existence. You don't want that to happen. So the only thing that keeps people at bay is understanding is, you know, if you push me, I'm going to push my button. You're going to go boom. And everybody doesn't want that. And so it, it, even the people who got nuclear cap capabilities don't want that to happen. So you, you, you don't you don't push that. So now you're telling me we may be sending troops over to Israel to fight Iran. I don't know if that guy was supposed to tweet that part. That is horrifying. 
Uh, yeah, this could go wrong really fast. Very fast. Because unlike the stuff in Afghanistan, let me, let me outline the difference for you. <laughs> unlike what happened in Afghanistan when they were fighting cave dwellers, the Taliban, and all this other kind of stuff. Those guys didn't have the uniform of a country on. You see the difference? A bunch of nut jobs running around with scarves on and, and old Toyotas launching missiles from the back of a cave. That's not a country. Those, those, are, those are hoodlums, terrorists, whatever. Same thing over in Gaza. That's not a country. That's not an army. Israel's been trying to, you know, basically tamp out these rats that are running around their country and tunnels and everything else, but it's not a country. Iran is a country with soldiers with uniforms. So at that point, you're not shooting at cave dwellers who happen to be idiots. You're shooting at deployed soldiers. In essence, at that point, and with obviously no congressional approval, you are entering into war. Big difference. I'm sure any of you guys in the military. <laughs> okay, so somebody said something. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, okay. John Plotkin says, Barry, wake up. These are deterrents. I think he meant to say, you know, the word. Quit scaring everyone. So you think I'm scaring people. <laughs> you make me laugh. So you think that a longshoreman strike that could potentially last a couple of weeks, it's scary to tell people what's happening. You think it's scaring people to say that if you decide to send our troops over to another country, and that things could go off the handle, that's scaring people. You think that people basically starving and dying and being looted in North Carolina and telling people what's really happening is scaring people. You think that telling people what our government is actually doing or not doing is scaring people. So, you, stop, you stepped up, so I'm going to ask you a question. What are you prepared to do? Mr. Plotkin, you tell me what you think sh you should do and what you're going to do to protect your family when the shit hits the fan. See, it's easy to go on a keyboard and say, oh, you're scaring people. You know what's really scary? What's really scary is if somehow they install Kamala Harris as president on November 5th. That's really effing scary. But you probably don't think that's scary either. Why not? Are you, are you a commie? Because I've seen what she has said. I've seen the exact words that have come out this woman's mouth. I don't want to pay unrealized capital gains. Do you? Do you have anything with a gain? Maybe you don't. Maybe that's why you don't care. It doesn't affect you. You don't have any family. You don't have any kids. You don't have any pets. You're eating bugs and want to, you know, live off the off the, <laughs> the government. But if you have anything, unrealized capital gains should scare you. See, when when people say these types of things, and I love when they say them because I can it it, it exposes them. If if. This government got in and put in CDBC, Central Digital Bank Currency. That's not scary to s some of these people because they have nothing to friggin' lose. How is this not scary? How, how is it telling the truth with everything you see right now in the world? You got this guy over here messing with Putin. You got the ragheads and the blah, 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 blah over there messing with Israel. You got our country with no basic leadership. Maybe I'm wrong. Tell me how it's not scary. Because you must have some inside knowledge that none of us do. 
for this not to be scary. How can it not be scary that someone wants to raise your taxes even more? See, if you step up here and start asking questions and talking like that, and you think it's a deterrent because they want you not focused on this, on this, there's too many things to be deterrent. Ugh, it makes no sense when people, good gosh. I, I'm, I'm just trying, when people say that, that tells me they are not looking at the truth. There is nothing I have said that you cannot go and document. Every time I do one of these shows, I tell you, hey, here's what they said. Listen to what they're saying. But I'm scaring people? A man says, I'm going to shut it down. Okay, okay, just in case you know. Maybe you didn't see it. The, the leader of the longshoremen said, and I quote, we will cripple you. That sounds friggin' scary to me. I have a wife to feed. I've got grandkids and a daughter. And she has to feed her kids. So when I hear some man saying, I will cripple you. Yeah, that's friggin' scary. That, that, those are fighting words where I come from. Oh, you think so? All right, well then let me get prepared. But you're... You, you, uh, it's just scaring people. It came out of his mouth. I take people at their word. I don't look for any deterrence. I'm not talking about Diddy. I don't care about Diddy right now. That's going to play its course out. He probably ain't going to make it. I want to know what you're going to do to protect America and American best interest. And you're saying, I'm just scaring people. Oh, I'm scaring people. Man, lots of mental illness. I don't know if this It's It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Um... Rush Limbaugh said scary things and, and was right. Because Rush Limbaugh, and basically I've studied a lot of Rush Limbaugh. I don't get into a lot of conjecture. I like to say, that's why I do so much video cutting. Here's what they said. Here's what they did. It's not me saying it. And you can actually hear something. So when Rush used to do a report, and he would, back then it wasn't a lot of video cuts, he would just read an article that somebody posted. And, it, and when he when he would read it and goes, hey, this is from the Wall Street Journal on Tuesday. Here's what John Frederick said. John said, blah, blah, blah. So unless you want to call John a liar, Rush knew here was what the guy wrote. It's pretty simple. It's really, really pretty simple. Volume, I'm old. What, turn it up? I, I can't really, I don't want to blast you. Uh, open your ears and eyes and be awake but not woke. Um... Back in the day, unions work with companies. They now work against the company. He said it. He wants to be a shareholder. They want to buy the stock. I just, you just should give it to me. That's what. That's exactly what he is saying at this point. Give it to me. I deserve it. You need to give me what you got. Um. They want to cause as much pain as possible before the election because they know what they're going to lose. Man. <laughs> what are your Pennsylvania Patriot? Rocket, Rocket Man said if U.S. attacks Iran, they will attack U.S. Now, the only thing that's kind of our safety valve or would have been a safety valve is that most of those people, the, the guys that want to cause havoc, are far away. So if Rocket Man were to launch a, a something from North Korea, we have time to do something. Same thing with Putin. Same thing with we would have time to basically fight that kind of conventional war and hopefully stop it. However, again, Mr. Plotkin, about to drop something truth on you. That was before we let in two, three, ten million people that we don't know who the hell they are. We, we, we don't know if they even need to shoot a bomb over here. We don't need to know. We, 10 million? Trump says 20? Say 5 million people? Newcomers? Who are already wreaking havoc on a smaller scale? Who knows if the rest of them are laying in wait? Who knows if they've been armed? We don't even know who they are. We don't even know where they are. We don't know where they came from. 
And so while we're waiting for, you know, Putin to launch something or Xi, Xi to, uh, Jinping to, to launch something or the Ayatollah to do something, we don't know who's already here. <laughs> and there's millions of them. Oh, but Barry, you're scaring people. Oh, you're just trying to scare people. I, I, I don't have it for my live videos, but I have a graphic that shows hmm, 13,000 murders. 16,000 people who did things with women, 460,000 convicts. That's one hell of an orc army waiting to be activated, but I'm the one scaring people. How many, I don't know, you can tell me, how many murderers does it take to do something in your household? All right, so we have an MC who's talking right now. I'm looking to see when Trump comes up, and then I can do stuff. I'm trying. I, 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 I. Your words don't scare me, Barry. They inform me. <laughs> I, every single thing I say every time I get on here, I always try to give you information that you can go look at yourself. So it's not like Barry's opinion. I have opinions, but I also try to say, look at what I, I, I have found out. This is something you may want to go check on because it could be something that interests you. Um, let's see. I chose I chose my name in part because what will happen in our country from within. Yeah. And I'm speaking to the sleepers. We don't and the thing is, we don't know. We don't know until it's gonna be too late. We see what they're doing criminal wise in, in, in terms of how they're assaulting people and, and doing crazy stuff. But those one, aren't the ones that we're, we're really worried about. Yeah, there's gang members taking over apartment complexes and stuff like that. But I'm worried about the people who are who are well trained, who are who are here, who have been told lay low until ready. See, the gang members are going to do gang stuff. We all know that. They're going to sell drugs. They're going to fight over territory. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to know out of that 10 million people who came in, how I many of those people are just, just waiting? They're just assets waiting to be told to do something. Do I know that? No, I don't know how many, but I know they're out there. And uh, they're just doing another speech. So they're doing speeches. So not, not too long before Trump uh, gets up here. Um we may have lots of scary things, but the United States has proven it can handle multiple threats at the same time, especially with Trump as commander-in-chief. But we've never, ever had a, a worry about stuff from within. You see, that's the difference. You see, what was it, 10, 12 guys flying, commanding one plane, took out... 3,800 people in New York? That was 11 or 12 people? What could a million people do? Not some lone wolf here or there. Not, not a bunch of guys, in a, you know, hanging out, coming up with some deviant plan. A million or two million or three million. In this country, we know, because we've lived here, we know how easy it is to access ammo and guns these people obviously know from a black market standpoint how easy it would be to access the same thing and just multiply just take a number pick a number out of the air how many people together in a squad could wreak havoc in this country on a big scale big scale so let me let me just give you an example I want you to take this to heart. doesn't matter how you feel about it. January 6th. We're, we're told it was an insurrection. These people didn't have any weapons. How many of them were there? 3,000? 5,000? 10,000? And, and, and people reacted. There was no National Guard. The Capitol Police were overrun. And we didn't know what we were going to do. I don't know. Let's say it was 50,000 people that came across the border decided they wanted to descend on our government. Other than 
by the time you activated everybody, don't even want to think it. You, you guys know. You, you know. It, it's, it's just absolutely crazy. Absolutely. Uh, the systemic corruption uh, only allows the, the complicit ones to, to actually do this stuff. Yep. Um, let's see here. Can you order stuff from Costco and they deliver? I don't know. I don't know, but you could you could probably um, well not probably you, you for sure can go on Amazon and have that done. They are greedy. When you make three hundred thousand a year and you stop the flow of supplies because you want another five hundred thousand, while fellow Americans are dying from the results of the hurricanes, this is disgusting. Yep. Um, let's see here. Somebody says, "How come no one answering my question?" I can't speak for other people and why they aren't answering your question, but I can only see between the camera and my monitor and then looking at the chat, I can only see something once in a while. So if you had a question that wasn't answered, um, if it was directed to me, I'm sorry I didn't see it. If it was directed to other people in the chat, maybe they didn't know the answer to your question. So um, go ahead and post it. So like just now, somebody said that somebody had asked earlier, does Costco deliver? Belinda here says yes. Co Costco delivers, and so does Sam. So if people see your question, and they know the answer, I'm sure they'll they'll give you uh, <laughs> give you the answer. Somebody just wrote, "Don't worry about it. Don't bother. Costco is being ransacked right now. Costco is being ransacked because people see. Oh my God, we, we can see what's going on. But I'm scaring people. Is what." That gentleman said, I'm scaring people. And and those of you who have been to Costco in the last couple of days go like, oh my God, <laughs> we're, we're seeing this stuff. Here, let, me, let, let me show you this if I can get it get it on the screen before um, he comes up. This this was this was off, awesome. Not awesome, but uh, which one was it? Was it this one? Um, I'm looking up something that Marjorie Taylor Greene posted. I think she posted it from her personal. Uh, uh, I got to show you this. This is this is good. And people were, you know, all kinds of freaked out when she posted this. And of course, the trolls were were all over it. But um, where is she? Where where is it? Uh, trying to pull it up. Oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> Toilet paper is always the first to go. The strike started last night halting imports and exports from Maine to Texas. We shouldn't be surprised or dependent on foreign countries for all of our needs. Put America first. And uh, you can see. You, you guys can see it. She took pictures. Wherever she, where, whatever store she was in, it's happening. I told you a couple of days ago. I, I understand that the, the gentleman said I was scaring people. <laughs> it's happening. Um, Biden and Harris committed treason, lied under oath, and buy out the whole store. <laughs> buy everything. Uh, Mark Cologne said I'd, she, he'd seen that post by MTG. Yeah, uh, yeah. But 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 I but I'm being I'm scaring people. Crazy. Um, Camel Toe knows she's gonna lose and she's gonna burn it all down. I think they're in the process of doing it to, to do it right now. Let me see. Is uh, he coming out? Here comes the man. So let me go ahead and uh, hopefully there's no music. Let me see. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's an honor to be here. We're working very hard in this state. We're leading in the state. And with Tommy's help, we're going to win this state. And with everyone else's help also, we're going to win it. Uh, we won it once. Uh, we had great primaries here. And uh, we think we did really fantastically another time. But we're, uh, we think we're going to win it very big with tremendous enthusiasm. We've never had the enthusiasm that we have right now. So I just want to thank Governor Thompson and
Thanks as well to Congressman Brian Stile. Thank you very much, Brian, for, yep. for the job. Appreciate it. And everyone else for being here today. It's a very impressive-looking group of media. This is largely a press conference. This is a big press conference. I was surprised they got that much hand. I don't know. Was the press — were they clapping? Because I was very impressive. <laughs> no, I was impressed, actually. But uh, now, a lot of respect. We have to be together. Before we begin, I want to send our love to the millions of people who are still suffering from the aftermath of Hurricane Helene. Yesterday, I was in Georgia to survey the terrible damage from the storm. It was terrible. And uh, Georgia was hit very, very hard. They're doing a great job. Governor's doing a great job. Everybody, they're all working together. And uh, we helped them uh, out a little bit. In North Carolina, the biggest problem uh, seems to be like zero communication. The biggest problem uh, seems to be like zero communication. The poles are all down. The wires are all down. And they asked me whether or not I could help with Starlink. It's uh, another genius concept of Elon Musk. And I called Elon, and they were having a hard time getting it. It's a, it's a hot thing. And Elon immediately got involved. And we have uh, the most incredible that they did in, in one day. They got tremendous communication. They went from no com I mean, literally no communication to tremendous. So I want to thank Elon Musk for what he's done in North Carolina. A little bit help in Georgia, too, where they had some areas that had a hard time with communication. He hooked it up to the satellites, which he feels very confident in doing. He likes satellites. You know, he likes rocket ships, satellites. And there's nobody better. He's something. He's a piece of work, I'll tell you. But he had it done in about 15 seconds. He said, look, it goes right up to the satellite. It's already back down. And they had so much, uh, they had such great communication so rapidly. It's incredible, actually. And uh, the situation in western North Car Carolina is very catastrophic, very bad. And uh, they don't even realize the extent of it yet. A lot of people are missing. But uh, we'll going to be working with them, with North Carolina. Great people, great state. And uh, we're working very hard with them to make sure that, uh, that it works out as well as it can. Amazingly, this is one of the biggest hurricanes anyone's ever seen. You know, it's late in the season, very unusual. I guess the water, the water was 20 feet high, and nobody expects that. People go up to the house, and they think they're safe on the second floor, and they weren't safe. This was uh, one of the they call it the waterfalls. This was one of the biggest they've ever seen, so it's too bad. Very late in the season, too. You almost don't even think of it as hurricane season. Our hearts break for every family that has lost a home, and they've lost uh, so much. They've lost everything in many cases. A lot of people don't have insurance, and uh, we have to come together as neighbors and friends and fellow citizens to support those in need, and there's a lot of those in need right now. Unfortunately, I look forward to being back in North Carolina and Georgia very soon, and also uh, Tennessee and Alabama. We we uh, had some big damage, big damage, but uh, but North Carolina was really hit. So we're going to work with them very hard and hopefully help them. We're here today to talk about how we're going to rescue American families from the nightmare of the Harris-Biden administration and launch a new generation of golden age for America. Uh, you know what's going on with the schools in our country. Not a good situation. Since Kamala Harris cast the deciding votes on the bills that caused the worst inflation in American history by far, by the way, higher prices, of course, the typical American family over $29,000. And you're continuing to pay $1,100 every single month, more, more than you were doing before. Nobody can afford that. Even if you get a salary increase, it's nothing compared to the kind of numbers you're talking about. Inflation is devastation. Inflation is country busting. It breaks countries. Look at Germany from centuries ago. Look at other countries, whether it's centuries ago or decades ago. Anything, any country that goes through inflation, and we went through a really bad period. We're the worst in our history. 8.4 million Americans are now working second jobs, the highest in more than 38 years. And you now have to make $111,000 a year. That's a lot of money to afford an average home. 
a 46 percent increase since when I was president, so it's 46 percent higher. And that's not even including the cost of interest, because interest went from 2 percent to 11 percent. And you can't get the money at 11 percent, so it's not 11, it's a lot higher than that. With her colossal big government negotiations, Kamala Harris, who's really, who destroyed San Francisco and destroyed California. San Francisco is the best city in the country 18, 19 years ago. Bob Tisch, a friend of mine from Lowe's, many of you know Bob Tisch, he said it was the best city in the country. He was a businessman that had holdings all over. He said San Francisco was the best. He wouldn't believe it. He passed away a number of years ago, but he wouldn't believe what's happened to it. And he's also added an estimated $6,300 a year in regulatory costs onto the backs of every American family. So Kamala Harris has done this, and she's uh, done it at a level like nobody's ever seen, with the help of Joe Biden. But I'm not sure Joe was involved, because I'm not sure he was involved in anything, to be honest with you. Now Kamala is coming back for more. So she ruins San Francisco. She ruins the state of California. And now she's coming back to destroy the United States of America, but we're not going to let it happen. As you know, she's a Marxist. Her father's a Marxist professor who nobody has spoken to. I'd love to talk to him. I would be interested in talking to him, actually. But uh, we can't let this happen. We were way up on Biden, 21 points up on Biden after the debate. And uh, they had a coup. They told him, you're not going to run. And he's not a happy man. He's pretending he's happy, but they took him out. He had 14 million votes. She had no votes. She was the first one that got broken in uh, the primaries. She never made it to Iowa. She was the first one out, and now she's running. The whole thing doesn't make a lot of sense. She had many people that much better. They had 22 people running, and she was the first one out. She went in, and she went out because people didn't like her. She wasn't good. And now she's the one that's representing the party, uh, and the press gives her a free pass. And that's a little ridiculous, isn't it, huh? But uh, also never happened uh, where we spent over $100 million on fighting Joe Biden, and then all of a sudden we're fighting somebody else. That's like a fight. The fighter's doing badly, and you say, okay, let's take him out and give somebody else a chance to win in the middle of the fight. So Kamala's plan is projected to raise the typical family taxes by $2,600. And the tax queen, you know, they called her the tax queen in California because she always had, she liked taxes. I've never seen anyone win a race where they raise taxes all the time, but she liked taxes. This is a unique, this is definitely a unique election anyway. The tax queen also wants the largest small business tax hike in history and a 33% tax hike on American small businesses which will send consumer prices skyrocketing. You think they're bad now. If Kamala gets four more years, she will crush family budgets with crippling energy costs thanks to her Green New Scam. The Green New Scam is one of the greatest, uh, most difficult things to be watching. The real number they want is $93 trillion. They want buildings taken down and new buildings built without windows because it's more efficient. Let's do that. Let's just tell people you have a beautiful apartment, but you don't have any windows. It's one of the great scams. But, you know, the amazing thing is that nobody talks about it anymore. They're not talking about the Green New Deal anymore. They're not talking about environmental anymore. They're not talking about the oceans will rise by one sixteenth of an inch over the next 400 years. They don't talk about it anymore. Something's happened. I don't know what it is. I think it's maybe it's not selling too well anymore. They call it now climate change because global warming wasn't working because the planet's actually gotten a little bit cooler recently. But climate change covers everything. It can rain. It can be dry. It can be hot. It can be cold. Climate change. Everything is. Look, and I'm, I, I believe I really am an environmentalist. I've gotten environmental awards. But I want clean, beautiful air and clean, beautiful water. That's all crystal clean water. And we want clean air. And, you know, during the last two years of my administration, we had the best on record. And we had uh, a lot of drill, baby drill. We had a lot of drilling, but we had the best on record. My plan will cut energy prices in half. Within 12 months, we're going to have energy prices for businesses. But 
in my opinion, maybe even more importantly for the average household, I said by 12 months from January 20th, which is the day we go into office, I hope we have a country left because we are what's going on now is very dangerous. I've been talking about World War III, what's going on now between Russia, Ukraine, and the Middle East blowing up all over the place. Uh, it's a very dangerous time, most dangerous time since the end of World War II, without even question. But my plan will cut energy prices in half. We're going to knock it out 50 percent, all. This is for families and businesses and everything. And with the artificial intelligence, as you know, and shocking, but you need more energy for to make that competitive with China and some others, but primarily China. They're going wild now. They're building tremendous electricity, electric capacity, as you know. But you need more electri electricity. They have to create tremendous amounts of electricity in order to compete, and more than we have right now for the whole country. So you have to more than double up what we have right now to be competitive. And we'll be able to do that. I'll be able to do that. They won't be able to do it. You have to make sure your environmental impact statements get approved very quickly. Otherwise, you'll never be able to compete. They don't do environmental impact statements in China, to the best of my knowledge. They have one man say, uh, you can build it, and that's the end of that. That was the environmental impact statement. We have to go through sometimes years of things, but all of that's going to be rapidly expedited. It's going to save you thousands of dollars on gasoline and home heating and air conditioning and electricity. We're going to so we're going to be down for the entire uh, energy package. Uh, you will be down by a minimum of 50 percent one year after January 20th. Nobody else will say that, but I can do that because we have more liquid gold under our feet than anybody, any other country. And uh, I know how to use it. We had it going so well, and now we're buying oil from Venezuela and lots of other places that we shouldn't be buying. I call it Venezuelan tar, because essentially it's tar. You know, it's uh, they have uh, the places that they hone it and develop it is right in the middle of Houston, right in the middle of Houston. We have a refinery that only does that oil. It's, it's the only one in the world that does that oil. Because it's not oil, it's tar. And if you're an environmentalist and you like Texas, because I love Texas, we just got a poll from Texas. We're, we're through the roof in Texas, which I love because I think it's an incredible place. But if you're an environmental person, the tar and all of the other things coming out of those chimneys and that in that uh, wonderful place, it's the only place in the entire world that does Venezuelan, I call it Venezuelan tar. But there's no reason for us to be doing it because we have more oil and gas. We have more, I say, liquid gold. I think it's the most, the best expression. We have more liquid gold than Russia, Saudi Arabia, any other country in the world. And we don't even use it. And ours is pure. Perhaps worst of all, Kamala's mass migrant invasion will destroy our economy, importing tens of millions of, I mean, think of it, more illegal aliens than we've ever even thought about taking in. And for me to watch her the other night standing up at a television set saying, uh, with a news conference saying how she's going to all of a sudden get involved at the border. She was the border czar. She did a horrible job. She allowed 21 million plus people to come in. And many of them, and you've heard me say this many times, they came from prisons and jails. They came from mental institutions and insane asylums. And they came from uh, terrorist camps where they trained them to come into the United States, and they come into the United States. Many, many terrorists. We have more terrorists come into the United States in the last three years than we have had in the last 30 years. And uh, these are the real terrorists. These are the real ones. We have no idea who they are. They let them come in, just open borders, just the dumbest thing I've ever seen, other than if you're trying to sign them up to vote, which is what they're trying to do. Kamala grants them all amnesty, and she's promised that it will obliterate. I mean, she promised them that they're going into Medicare and Social Security. And if they go into Medicare and Social Security, then she's going to kill Medicare and Social Security. And we're not going to let her do that. And I didn't let anything happen to either of them during my four years. We didn't raise the age for Social Security. They're going to end up raising it by six or seven years. 
if they get in. With four more years of Kamala, you'll have a 1929-style depression. That's sort of the ultimate depression. 1929 was the worst. You don't get worse than that. And uh, it took 25 years to recover, frankly. You know, people say, oh, we recovered with Roosevelt. No, it took 25 years to recover from it. And it was tremendous pain and suffering. And that's going to happen again. And I've been very good at predicting things. I've heard the hat says Trump was right about everything. And it wasn't even my hat. I didn't even do it. But somebody had made a lot of money. Trump was right about everything. But when I win, the next Trump economic boom begins the moment the polls close in Wisconsin on November 5th. And again, uh, Brian and Tommy and uh, all of the people that have been so great here, uh, we're seeing numbers that a lot of people have never seen, real numbers that a lot of people haven't seen, especially as Republicans. Uh, they haven't seen because they want to have our country back. They don't want to have millions of people pouring in that are criminals, that are murderers. Think of it. We had 13, and this was these are numbers that were never announced because they never wanted to do that. They never really talked about these numbers. They've never done it in many years, but they did here. And I think somebody at, whether it's Border Patrol or Justice, but somebody said it has to be done. It was announced just before she went to the microphone to say that she was going to do a good job at the border. And a lot of people were saying, well, why hasn't she done it in four years? Why, why are you doing a good job now? She's done a horrible job, even where they tried to give it a little bit of a kick two months ago, three months ago so they could look a little bit better for the election. They didn't say that they're flying thousands of people over and those numbers aren't included, or the app, where they have an app that's being used by the cartel leaders, the people that are making billions of dollars. The cartel leaders, think of this, call the app, and they say where to drop the illegal migrants. This is done under their administration. It's uh, Nobody's ever seen anything like it. But they said they closed the border, but they didn't say that uh, airplanes are flying over with hundreds of thousands of migrants dropping them all over the place. And I'll tell you what, the people in these towns are scared. They're scared. Even if they haven't arrived there yet, they're scared. When you take a look at what's happening in Ohio, Springfield, where you have a town of 50,000 people that's beautiful, it's uh, safe, a great place, idyllic, actually. And now they've, in a short period of time, dropped 32,000 people there. Uh, and some of those people are pretty tough people. And the mayor of the town, I don't know him, but he seems like a nice man, but he doesn't want to talk anything. He doesn't want to say anything bad. He, he wants to be politically correct. And all he says is we're trying to get interpreters because none of the people, virtually none of them, speak English. So he's looking for interpreters when he should be looking for people to take them home because this country cannot sustain what's happening to it. We can't sustain hundreds of thousands of people coming in a month or, more importantly, in a short period of time, 21 million plus. We have no idea what it is. You have gotaways. Nobody has any idea, if you include the gotaways, what the number. We can't even really say, you know, with other countries like China, you say it's 1.4 billion. With India, you say it's 1.5 billion. They're big. With us, you don't really know what the number is. You say, uh, how many do we have? Is it 320? Is it 325? Is it 350? Nobody knows. If you go to a government agency, say, how many people are in our country? They have no idea. Well, we're going to have an idea very soon. Under my leadership, real median household income rose by $7,684. And that's before the pandemic. And even after the pandemic, the annual income was up six thousand four hundred dollars we did a great job in the pandemic never got the credit we deserved uh, but we uh, did an amazing job operation warp speed is being studied by many many schools both militarily and business-wise operation warp speed even my greatest enemies they say what a job that was that was a job like no other nobody else has ever done and it's ripped the world apart. Every country got ripped apart, including China. China was delayed, but it was hit harder proportionally probably than almost any country. Uh, it was a terrible time. Probably $60 trillion in damage. And caused by the Wuhan lab, I said that from the beginning, it came out of Wuhan. 
and uh, the Wuhan lab. It wasn't from bats in a cave that was 2,000 miles away. It wasn't from Italy. It wasn't from France. They blamed everybody. It's really the China virus. But uh, we did a great job with the ventilators, with the, um, the masks and the gowns and everything. You know, when we got here, the cupboard, our cupboards, I used to say our cupboards were bare. We had nothing. No president put anything in for a pandemic. And I don't blame him. Who would have thought? I thought it was sort of an ancient thing. It didn't, wouldn't happen now. So it wasn't, you know, something that I ever mentioned very much. I didn't blame other presidents, but they didn't put anything into it. So we had the cupboards were bare, and all of a sudden we heard there's something coming from China. And uh, terrible. We had the greatest economy in the history of our country. We gave you the biggest tax cuts in the history of our country and the biggest regulation cuts by far in the biggest, all by far in the history of our country. And... Uh, Rebuilt our military, but a lot of that, not relatively speaking, maybe, but a big chunk went to Afghanistan, where they're one of the biggest sellers of military equipment now in the world. And what I say is the most embarrassing moment in the history of the United States, that we took the soldiers out first. You're supposed to take the soldiers out last. A child would know that. I brought a child up to the dais once, and I gave him the facts in front of a very big a crowd of maybe 10,000 people, maybe more. I gave him the facts. I said, so would you take the military out first or last? He said, I take the military out last, sir. He was five years old. I said, how old are you? He said, five. A lot of you saw that. As president, I will deliver gigantic tax cuts for working families, and we will have no tax on tips, no tax on overtime, and no tax on Social Security benefits for our seniors. And that's a very big thing. But especially the last one for our seniors, because they've been decimated. Young people have too, but they've been decimated, seniors, on their fixed incomes. Uh, but nobody's ever been hurt more, nobody has been hurt more than seniors with respect to inflation. Inflation has just absolutely destroyed seniors. So I'm giving them no tax on Social Security benefits, and that'll make up for some of it. This was all created by Biden and Harris, although nobody knows, when I say Harris, nobody knows who I'm talking about, so Kamala. And while working Americans catch up, we're going to put a temporary cap on credit card interest rates of 10 percent because those rates are going up to 22, 24, 26 percent. And it's not sustainable. It's not fair. So it'll be temporary, but we have to help people. They, they can't pay those rates. We're going to unleash American energy drive the prices way down. We're going to stop the people from pouring into our border. We're going to have a mass deportation of criminals. We have to get the criminals out of our country. They're not going to help us. Uh, again, you had 13,000, more than 13,000, to be exact, 13,099. Uh, and uh, these are murderers. These are murderers that have murdered in many cases, about 30 percent of the cases, more than one person. And in some cases, more than five people. These are real murderers. These make our bad people look like innocent people. Uh, I know a lot of uh, the talk from the radical left people was, well, these immigrants don't commit crime. No, these people are among the worst in the world. They come from, from the Congo in Africa. Many people from the Congo. I don't know what that is, but they come out of jails in the Congo. You know, they're letting their jail population come into the United States. Their jails are being emptied into the United States. Their gang members are being taken out of Caracas, Venezuela, and lots of other places, which was a rough city, rough, very dangerous city. And they're being delivered into the United States, their gang members. And these are tough gang members. You see what's happening in Aurora, in Colorado. The mayor is petrified. He's he doesn't, I mean, he's petrified, but the governor is a mess. He's, he doesn't know what the hell. He's a Democrat liberal. And uh, they're taking over real estate, lots of real estate. The governor doesn't know what to do. And, you know, they want to be politically correct. They don't want to say anything. They're so afraid of saying anything and offending anybody. They have to go in. They have to get them out. Uh, but uh, when you look at what's happened in Aurora in Colorado, it's incredible. And Springfield is unbelievable. Again, a beautiful community, and now almost immediately, 32,000 more people 
And uh, these are people that have had a rough life, too. They're tough. Some of them are real tough. But they've had a rough life. It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. People in Springfield are moving out. They have to move out. They can't. They're not going to be able to live there. I'm going to appoint Elon Musk, who's a fantastic guy, to lead a government efficiency commission tasked with saving trillions of dollars in fraud, waste, and abuse, and driving down inflation and driving down costs. We have tremendous fat, tremendous fat. I mean, just one example. When I came in, uh, I was asked by Boeing to sign a contract with, for the purchase of a new Air Force One. And uh, which is actually two planes. A lot of people don't know it. In a way, it's four planes because it's you know, sort of Air Force One becomes the plane that the president uses. And I was asked to do it. And I was able to cut $1.5, $1.6 billion off the deal without any changes, except I'm, I was giving it a better looking paint job. And we ordered new ones, you know, because we have uh, Air Force One is 32 years old, two planes, 32 years old. And you'd come and you'd land it next to some of these planes from Saudi Arabia and a lot of other places, United Arab Emirates is a beauty. Uh, but you'd land the plane and the plane looked awfully shabby. It was time, 32 years old. So I got uh, new ones, but I, when I came in and they asked me to sign a 5.6 or $5.7 billion contract. Now they're very special planes, you know, because it's like, you know, people hear billions for airplanes, but they're very special. I can't even say you why, but I can't tell you that. I'm not supposed to. But uh, they are very expensive, but incredible planes from Boeing. And I said, I'm not going to sign it. It's too much. And Boeing came back and they cut $400 million off just by my saying that. And I said, nope, it's too high. I has to, it has to have a three in the front of it. It has to have a three. Because this was a five, right? 5.6, 5.7 billion. I said, nope, it's too high. And uh, they called back a week later and they took another $250 million off. So I got $650 million with like about two minutes of conversation. I said, no, I'm not doing it. It has to have a three. And this went on for about a month. And I sort of forgot about it. I said, look, forget it. Well, let's not do it. And uh, lo and behold, about four months later, I get a call from Dennis. This was prior to the... Uh, horrible accidents, the two accidents that really hurt Boeing. I mean, it was the greatest company in the world. I think it was thought of as the greatest company in the world, and now it's uh, not considered that. They went down a long way, but this was when it was prime time, Boeing prime time, at the beginning of my term. And they said, uh, here's the story, sir. We thought we had a deal at $5.7 billion. We'll do it for $3,900,000. And ninety nine million nine 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 and ninety nine cents, one penny less than four. I said you got a deal, so I saved about a billion six. Same exact plane, nothing different. It's not like oh gee, we have cheaper engines or we have no generation system or the wings are smaller or lots of things that you can do to cheapen it up. No, the exact same plane, except we had a much better paint job, and we saved one point six billion dollars. And it took me like three months. And actually, the last part was the most effective because I gave up on him. And uh, he called up out of the blue. In fact, when he called, I said, the head of Boeing, what the hell does he want? That's always the best way to negotiate when it doesn't matter to you so much, right? And I said, what does he want? And then he said, you know, the plane that we've been talking about a few months ago? Yeah, tell me about it. That's when he made the best offer. So, so we saved a billion six or a billion seven. On, for that, I said, so you're going to make a billion seven to build a, an airplane? That was the way I looked at it. And you have so much. Elon Musk is a master of that, and he's so into it because he loves the country so much. He endorsed me with a, the warmest endorsement. He thinks it's very important that I win because we're going to save our country. If these people win, we're not going to have a country. But uh, we're going to have Elon do it, and he'll be able to save... I think trillions of dollars. I really do. I think trillions of dollars. And nobody in the country will feel a thing except we'll save our country. And we'll then start paying down debt. But we have deficits. I think we're going to have a $2 trillion deficit with Biden this year or Kamala. Uh, $2 trillion. It's not sustainable. You can't do that. 
And China's gotten totally out of control. As uh, you know, they've, they're, the deficit with China is incredible. The deficit with the European Union is massive, like $320 billion. And, you know, we have a new one now, Mexico, because Mexico is starting to get a little rambunctious with the car business. And uh, for those people in United Auto Workers, the head of the union is incompetent. The deal he made in allowing the United States to go to uh, all electric is insane because people don't want to buy all electric. They, uh, I think electric cars are great, but, you know, it's a market, a little percentage, probably 10 percent. I don't know, some percentage. I think they're great, but they don't go far. They're made in China and they're very expensive. And not everybody can have them. They want everybody to have an electric car. It won't work. We don't have enough like electricity right now to take care of our homes and our buildings in California. Uh, Gavin Newscomb has a situation that's unbelievable. He's having blackouts and brownouts every week. And now we're supposed to, on top of it, feed cars all of this electricity. So it doesn't make so I'll be terminating that on day one. And again, we'll, we're all for electric cars. I think it's great. I think Tesla, I think Elon makes great cars. And you know, somebody said, did he ever speak to you about it? Because you know the way I've been saying this for two years. It's a tribute to him. He never mentioned it to me once. It's pretty amazing. He never met. He didn't say, well, listen, you got to lay off because I'm a big fan of electric cars, but not for everyone. You have to have gasoline powered cars and hybrids are great. And uh, some new ones are coming on the market. We have uh, hydrogen. Hydrogen is a hot one right now, but it is a little problem. It tends to blow up on occasion. And if it does blow up, you are unrecognizable. Uh, they will never be able to see who you were. Maybe a blood sample, but it's a bad blow up. I would say that's a serious problem. So I don't expect to be buying a hydrogen car for myself. Uh, but uh, a lot of great things are, are in the marketplace because we're here in Wisconsin with the great Governor Thompson. He's a great man. He's a great politician, one of the most popular, I think, the most popular politician in the history of the state. Um, and it's an honor that he even does this. I mean, he just feels it's, he's a little like Elon in that sense. He, he feels it's so important. But one of the founding fathers of school choice, I didn't even know that until a couple of days ago. But he's a big school choice. A lot of people are. I got lots of calls. I got lots of calls. Uh, I even got a call from Rupert Murdoch, who I have a lot of respect for. And he said, school choice, school choice. You have to go with school choice. That was just today. I said, I didn't know he was so into school choice, but he feels very strongly about it. He's a good man, too. I also want to talk about another way that we can help the American family supporting school choice for every child. And, you know, you have to do the school choice thing because right now we are just about at the bottom of every list, and yet we're number one on every list of cost per pupil. Uh, cost per student, we're number one, and if you look at a list of the top 40 uh, nations, we are at the bottom of the list. We're number 40, number 39 all the time, and often led by Norway and Denmark and Sweden and China. It's in the top five, usually. Pretty amazing. With 1.4 billion people, pretty amazing. But China's in the top five, and we're number 40, number 39. And one of the things we'll be doing is moving education back into the uh, – States, and you know, if you think about it, like a state like this, I think would do fantastically well with education. Uh, I think that a state like Iowa and Idaho and uh, Indiana, I think you'd end up. I was looking at them the other night, looking at them just from common sense, you know, with a party of common sense. And then I said, more than anything else, now with a party of common sense, because that's more important than anything else. It's we don't want men and women sports. We want to have strong borders, and we want to have fair elections, not rigged elections. And uh, we have a lot of problems in this country. But if you take a look at all of it, uh, everything that we're doing, every single thing that we're doing is based on structure and common sense. I was looking at the various states, and I think 35 states could be the equivalent of Norway and Denmark. If you think about it, they'd run great. I mean, I think Iowa would do great. I think uh, Idaho would do great. I mean, these are states that have no debt. 
and they have low taxes, they've done great. And then you have the same, you know, you have a guy like Gavin wouldn't do very well, I don't think, with it. He signed a, he signed a thing yesterday, somebody told me, I, I haven't, it's not confirmed, but he signed a document yesterday that said you're not allowed to ask a voter for ID, identification, and if you do, it's like a crime. Why would anybody do that? In other words, this was signed yesterday or the day before by Gavin Newscomb, a, ver a failed governor, and it said, if you ask anybody whether or not anything having to do with their identification, now for everything else, you, you're allowed to have a card, but for voting, which is our most important act, it's considered virtually a crime, so you're not allowed to ask for identification. Now, there's only one reason that's done. That's because they want to cheat on elections. When you have something like that where there will be no asking, it's not a question of having voter ID. It's a question you're not even allowed to ask. And if you ask, it's a crime. Uh, that's only because of the fact that they want to cheat on elections. And we can be nice and we can be politically incorrect, but the only thing they're going to do there is cheat on elections. And uh, we just can't let this happen. The city of Milwaukee is the home of first and oldest choice program. You have the school choice program in Milwaukee is the oldest in the whole nation in Milwaukee, which has been run by Democrats for over half a century. It's incredible. Families are faced with one of the worst public school systems in the entire country, considered pretty much the worst. But there are some others that are right there with you. I guarantee you that only 16 percent of Milwaukee public school students are reading at grade level. And only 10% can do math at grade level. So you're talking about 16% and 10% can basically read or do math. School choice gives Milwaukee children a lifeline to a better education. Eighth grade students in Milwaukee and in Milwaukee schools and choice programs are more than twice as likely to be proficient or advanced in math. And that's good, but you know, when you say we're going to double up from 16% or double up from 10%. It's not really great, is it? And out, outsourced, uh, we're going to outsource and outscore other public school districts. So they want to compete against, start off by competing against certain public school districts. And I guess that's a good place to start. But it's, uh, they got to straighten out the schools in this country. Schools are really bad. And uh, we're going to be, I think we're going to be able to do that. I think we're going to be able to do a lot of it. But if they're run by the state and run by, like, the parents, because in Washington, you know, half of the buildings, uh, such a large number, every building you pass in Washington says Department of Education. You would have, you can have a lot of, uh, like, vacant space. Now we can have somebody else maybe move in. But the, these schools, these, it's massive. It's massive. I figure we'll have like one person plus a secretary. You'll have a secretary and a secretary. We'll have one person plus a secretary, and all the person has to do is, are you teaching English? Are you teaching arithmetic? What are you doing? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. And, uh, and, and are you not teaching woke? Not teaching woke is a very big factor. But we'll have a very small staff. We can occupy that staff right in this room, actually. I think this room is too large. And all they're going to do is they're going to see that the basics are taken care of. You know, we don't want to have somebody get crazy and uh, start teaching a language that we don't want them to teach. But uh, we'll do something with education. I think uh, when we move it into the local districts. But the big thing is we're going to uh, take it all out of Washington. We're going to send it all back to the states. We're going to spend less than half. And we're going to have much better education. But in many states, you will be the equivalent. I mean, you have states that are incredible. And uh, in many states, you'll be the equivalent of a uh, top three, top four school, like a Norway or, or a uh, Sweden is very strongly thought of, too. Although lately, they've had some problems, you know, all about that. If you want a better education for your child, Kamala Harris stands in your way. Kamala and the radical left Democrat Party want to keep black and Hispanic children trapped in family government. I mean, I think that's really the reason. It, it's all Democrat we're talking about. You know, of the top 25 dangerous cities, virtually every single one of them is a Democrat-run city. So I think there'll be a lot of changes made. I really do. I, can't, I, I just can't believe people can continue to go for this.
But by contrast, I believe that school choice is the civil rights issue of our time. A child's fate should be the — and should be determined by their — you have to — it has to be determined by their love of education, by their parents, by so many factors. But it can't be determined by a zip code. And no parent should be forced to send their child to a failing government-run school. I mean, they, in all fairness, they get into these schools, they're so bad. You don't give them a chance. We spend more money on education than any other country in the world. And I said before, much more money per pupil. We're number one on every list. And yet our public schools get worse, and the results get worse, and it goes just so horrible to see it. I mean, think of it, they graduate from public school and they can't read, they can't write. This is people that actually literally graduate, can barely read or write. Wisconsin private schools receive nearly 3,000 less per student per year through the school choice programs and public schools, yet they achieve far better outcomes. A great job they've done, actually, even as they fail to educate our youth our opponents are using government schools to indoctrinate children, pushing radical transgender ideology on children, and changing the child's gender without even parental consent. Can you imagine that? Your child leaves for school and comes home, and their gender has been changed. I don't want to get into the details, but it's not even believable. Without parental consent, all of that's changing. It's changing immediately. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention with all of the people coming in, they're taking black and Hispanic jobs. The black population, their unemployment is way up over the last few months, and, no, and the fake news isn't reporting it. And the reason they're way up is the illegal migrants are taking the black population's jobs and the Hispanic population's jobs. And that's not fair. That's not a good thing. But that's what's happening. They come in, and many of these people, again, and many of them aren't. Many of them are criminals. Many of them are people that have murdered people we just don't know about. We know nothing about these people because they came in. They didn't have to report. They didn't have to give a piece of paper. I had remained in Mexico very strong. The president of Mexico approved it. I said, look, you're going to have to approve it. He said, I won't approve that. Why would I approve that? Why, am I stupid? I said, no, you're not stupid. You're very smart. That's our problem. You're too smart. He said, but you're going to approve it. And he said, why would I do that? I said, because if you don't, I'm going to put 100 percent tariffs on your cars coming in. And we're going to make a fortune. He said, like you said, I will approve it. it took me about two minutes. <laughs> but that is one more reason why I'll fight for the right of every parent to send their child to a public, private charter or a religious school of their choice. We have to be able to have school choice. School choice is very important. And the Democrats are very much opposed to it, as you know. And I have great faith in teachers. You know, I don't care if they're union or non-union. I have great respect for teachers. They're very — I've had some teachers that were so good, had a lot to do with uh, my life. Now, some people would say they did a really bad job with him. And that's possible. That's possible. But, no, they had a lot to do with me, I will tell you. I have great, great respect for teachers at a level that few people would understand. We want federal education dollars to follow the student rather than propping up a bloated and radical bureaucracy in Washington, D.C., which is what we're doing now. Ultimately, we want to close the federal Department of Education, and we're going to do that, and we're going to move it all back into our states. And as I said, some states are going to be unbelievable, and some states are not going to do a good job. The ones that aren't going to do a good job are the ones that aren't doing a good job now and everything else. We're joined today by two beneficiaries of school choice here in Wisconsin, sisters, Michaela and Leah Lawrence. Where may you — look at you. Look. Both attended St. Marcus Lutheran School, a high-performing K-8 through private school. And uh, it's a choice school in the inner city, Milwaukee. And I love Milwaukee. We had such a great convention here. They treated us so well. I also like the result. If I didn't get the right result, I probably wouldn't like Milwaukee. I got a great result. But it was beautiful. The building was beautiful. The, we're going to come here. I believe my people are working. We're going to come here in the same arena. The arena was great. And we're also going to go to Green Bay. We're going to be announcing it pretty soon. Green Bay for a big, big one. We're going to have two big ones, very big ones, maybe a third. Uh, 
of a little bit more of this nature. But we're going to do uh, your main, your basketball arena. We're all sort of set. And we're going to do Green Bay. We'll do it the day before the game as opposed to the day of the game. Uh, but Michaela graduated with honors from high school in May and is going to school for dental hygiene. And Lee is now a senior in high school, a, a wrestler, wow, at Wisconsin Lutheran, who went to the state finals twice, wow, and is currently scouting engineering schools across the country. She's looking at a really great engineering school. So, Leah and Michaela, if you could come up, I'd love you to say a few words, please. Thank you. Who's, who's the wrestler here? I'm not, I'm not going to mess with her. That's good, please. All right. Well, my name is Michaela Lawrence, um, as you already know. Um, just first want to come up here um, and thank everyone for the opportunity for me speaking. Um, on behalf of my family, I thank uh, my dad um, specifically for um, putting me and my sister in choice schools and having the opportunity um, to learn. Um, personally, um, going to the high school I went to, Luther Preparatory, um, really learned about Christ-like behavior and um, how to show that in the outside world. And a person like me going to college now, you get to the outside world and it's like, wow, a lot of these people really need Jesus. <laughs> um, but I'm thankful that for that opportunity. I'm thankful um, for President Donald Trump, too, uh, someone who supports that opportunity that I got um, from grade school um, to high school, uh, learning about Christ and having the choice to really have an opportunity to get a good education and have a relationship, a close relationship with all my friends and teachers. So thank you. That's so beautiful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm, my name is Leah. I'm the wrestler, uh, by the way. <laughs> and I'm so grateful again um, for getting the opportunity to come out, to come out here and speak. Um, on behalf of School Choice, uh, this is an amazing program. I'm so thankful that Mr. President Trump, he is um, helping out with this program. He's doing so much for education, and education in Milwaukee especially is, is in dire need, um, especially right now. So I do want to personally thank um, Mr. Trump for helping us with this. Uh, thank you. Thank you. What's your record That's pretty good. She's got a good record. <laughs> you said, what's your record in wrestling? Thank you both. Beautiful job. Thank you, Doug. How nice is that, huh? Very proud of you both. It's amazing. So thank you. And also with us is Tukara Bell, a mom of three whose family has been uplifted by school choice. And so, Tukara, could you come up and say a few words, please? Come on up. It's very exciting. Um, thank you all for this opportunity. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I am a mom of three. We benefit from the School Choice Program. This is my daughter, Cynthia Dunlap. Um, and School Choice, it gives us an opportunity to send my children to a school that aligns with my morals and my values, and while also giving my children a personalized educational experience, um, I greatly appreciate it, and they would not have these opportunities if it was not for student choice. Cindy, would you like to say something? Hi, I'm Cynthia. Um, school choice has given me so many opportunities that any other school could ever give me. I am so thankful for school choice. and. Um, I also have a gift for you, President oh. <laughs> Wow. On behalf oh, of Trinity Thank you very Lutheran much. of Christ I'm going to wear it tonight. Nice. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Very much. Thank you. Thank you, That's really nice. Come on. You hold, hold that for you. Don't, don't take it from me. I want to keep it. So, uh, again, universal school choice, very important. We're backing it all the way, 100%. And, uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. And uh, there's a lot of media here, so if you'd like to ask a couple of questions, I think we'll do that. So uh, go ahead, please. Brian? Mr. President, thanks for coming. Yes, thank you. Um, under your administration, you didn't have the chaos in the world. No. I wanted to get your comments on what's going on right now in Israel and Iran, that conflict. 
Brian, I think it's the most dangerous time we've had, certainly since the end of the Second World War. I think it could end up being a world war. You have two, two hot spots, and you'll probably have a third, maybe, with Taiwan. But you have uh, Ukraine and Russia, and that's going, that's out of control. I met with President Zelensky, and I got along very well with President Putin. I think I can get it solved, uh, but we should get on, and immediately you have to, I think I would like to be able to solve it while President-elect, if I get elected, I'm going to work on that immediately. It's going to be my first two phone calls. And uh, my second is going to be, uh, we're going to close the border immediately and have people come into our country, but legally. And my third will be drill, baby, drill. You know, it's like not too complicated. But uh, those, uh, that call, that series of calls, I think is going to be very important. Uh, that war, uh, millions of people are being killed. I don't think people recognize how many people are being killed. I don't think it's being properly reported. It's a horrible, horrible war. And then you see what's happening even today. You know, where is that going to stop? And, uh, you know, you have to give Israel a lot of credit for being able to protect itself. You look at these forces, they shot down almost 200 rockets today. But this is not the way uh, anybody should have to live. So we're going to uh, obviously be very involved in the Middle East. This would have never happened. We did the Abraham Accords. I think everybody, including Iran, would have been in the Abraham Accords had I taken over as president. Uh, I believe, I think even Iran would have been in the Abraham Accords ultimately. It would have been great for everybody, and you would have had peace in the Middle East. Uh, we got four countries solved, and very respected countries, as you know, they were signed up. And then uh, when Biden took over, they, they haven't signed one country. I would have had every, every country in the Middle East would have. Uh, been signed up. The only question would be Iran, and I think they would have, you know, for certain reasons, I think they probably would have been there too. It would have been peace in the Middle East. And said, "This is just tearing it apart. This has really been, uh, this has really been bad." But uh, they have to finish that process. What, however, it turns out, they have to finish the process. This is uh, a little bit like uh, two kids fighting in a schoolyard. Sometimes you have to just sort of let it go a little bit, and uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, it's really caused by a lack of respect for the United States of America. This would have never happened. Israel would have never happened. October 7th never would have happened. Russia never would have invaded Ukraine. And for four years, they didn't. They would have never invaded. We wouldn't have had inflation. We wouldn't have had not the withdrawal, because we were withdrawn. We're the ones that got it ready to withdraw. But we wouldn't have had that uh, horrible, most embarrassing day in the history of our country. And a lot of other good things would have happened. And right now we have a, a world in chaos. Uh, I always quote Viktor Orban because he's a very respected, tough guy. They always say, he's a tough guy. Well, I guess they're all sort of tough guys. But Viktor Orban said, if Trump comes back, you won't have any wars. You won't have any wars. And he's about as tough as they get. And he said it loud and clear. And he said, why? But you won't have any wars. So I just want to see stuff. Look, there's... There's no huge benefit. I think Europe has to pay up more because it's very unequal and they have to pay up more for that and they have to do it now because we're, you know, we have an ocean in between. It's much more important to Europe than it is to us. But we want to see that war taken care of and we certainly want to see peace in the Middle East as soon as it's possible. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Please. Ukraine territory in order to end the war. And the second part here is if you were president right now, after Iran launched its more than 200 missiles towards Israel, last week you had suggested that if Iran tried to attack you, that you would blow the country to smithereens. How would you handle Iran right now? Well, would you I use U.S. force? That, yeah. Would you use U.S. force? Yeah. No, I wouldn't be around if they did that. But let's assume I'm not around. The president of the United States should blow that country to smithereens because you can't do that. And the president should make a statement to that effect. Uh, but as you know, I mean, you're in danger right now. You are in danger now because of uh, them and their challenge to me. And the reason they did that is because I had them in a position where they would have made a deal. They had no money. There was no terrorism. There was no money for Hamas. There was no money for Hezbollah. You know that. I mean, that was reported when I was leaving. They said there was absolutely no terrorism. In four years, we had no terrorism. 
And a large part of that was Iran had no money. And I wasn't looking to hurt them. I was looking to, I want, to, I want them to be wonderful and great and happy. But we didn't want them to have a nuclear weapon. They can't have a nuclear weapon. Can you use U.S. force today? Well, I don't want to say what it used because I don't want to give up negotiating abilities because so I don't want to say exactly. But uh, they understand wh where I stand. And we have to get back to being at least a partially civilized world. What's going on today? They sent 200 missiles over to Israel. And now people would say, well, now it's Israel's turn, right? That's what happens. It goes back and forth. It could happen for a long time. Should have never happened. It would never have happened. And uh, again, Iran was not in a position to sponsor terror because they didn't have any money. I mean, they, now they have $300 billion. Uh, Biden took off all the sanctions. I had sanctions. I told China, if you buy any oil from, if you buy oil from Iran, that was their biggest customer, you're not going to do any business in the United States, and we're going to put tariffs all over your products. And they said, well, we're going to pass. And they didn't buy. And I said the same thing to other countries, and they didn't buy. And uh, time went by, and all of a sudden, they had no money. And they would have made a deal, and I would have made a good deal for them. I'm not looking to hurt them. I want them to be great. Let them be happy and good. But they can't have a nuclear weapon. And now they're very close to having one, and uh, it's very dangerous for the world, very dangerous for the world. I mean, biggest, the biggest problem today, in my opinion, the biggest risk is the nuclear weapons, the weaponry. It's so powerful today, and I know because I rebuilt the United States military. During my term, I rebuilt it. We had fighter jets that were 50 years old, and uh, we have all F-35s, and we have, great, we have great planes now. We have largely new. We gave... A lot of it to Afghanistan, stupidly. New goggles, they have new, the newest goggles. They had the best goggles. They never fought at night because they couldn't see, but now they can fight at night. They have the goggles. They have the, the trucks that are armor-plated. Think of the 70,000 trucks. 70, 000. Go to the biggest used car lot in America, and they probably don't have more than four or 500 cars available at any one time. We have 70,000 trucks, many of them millions of dollars, each armor plated with the finest four, five, six inch armor on these trucks. And we gave it to them. And they sell the equipment. And they're one of the largest sellers of military equipment. They're selling the equipment that we gave them. Who would do that? Who would be so stupid to do that? Who would move the military out first? Because, you know, they have American hostages. Most importantly, we lost 13 great soldiers. And of tremendous importance, we have many soldiers that lost their arms and their legs and were just obliterated because of stupid people. We should have left from Bagram, not that base. We had it all mapped out, and we had options. We had a lot of things they had to do, everything they had to do, and they weren't doing it. And we said, good, the deal's dead, and then they did it. We would have had that. It was perfect. It was a beautiful thing. It was going to go well, and they respected me. They respected me. Remember, we didn't have one soldier killed in 18 months in Afghanistan. The Taliban, I mean, the Taliban, that's their fighter. And I spoke to Abdul, the head of the Taliban, a couple of times. But I explained to him, you can't do that. You can't do that, Abdul. And from the time I spoke to him, we didn't have one, not one fighter killed, not one American soldier killed or even shot at for 18 months. And then I left, and we had these clowns take over, and it all blew up. It was not going to blow up. It was going to be good. Uh, one of the worst things they did is give up the largest, one of the largest air bases in the world, the largest runways, most powerful runways, uh, very deep with concrete. You could land anything on them, you know, meaning the weight. You could land any any plane on a very, very long, I think like 18,000 feet. Uh, and to give that up, and the importance of it, and it was in Afghanistan, the importance of Bagram, and very important, was it was one hour away from China where they make their nuclear weapons, right in that area. But one hour away from China. Forget about Afghanistan. We should have never been there. But we were one hour away from where China makes their nuclear weapons. And now, you know who occupies it? China. How about that? They left. So I was never going to. I was moving out. We were all set to move. I'm the one that got the soldiers down to that level. We had no problem. And we were going to move out. Soldiers would have moved out less. We would have taken the equipment. We would have done everything. I had no confidence in the army, in meaning in their army, the people that they were giving us, because they were loyal to the other side. I always knew that. That's why you had so many uh, blue on brown and brown on blue. You had so many attacks. 
where we train them, and then we hand them a gun, and they turn the gun around, they shoot the sergeants and everybody else there, the Americans. I said, well, that is something. We never had so many attacks like that. We trained them, and as soon as they get a gun that's loaded, they turn it and they shoot everybody. And I said, what the hell is going on over here? And they're tough fighters, too, but they weren't. The reason, uh, the reason they were even in there is because that they were the highest paid soldiers in the world. When Mattis would say, sir, they're fighting for their country, well, they weren't really fighting for their country because otherwise you wouldn't have had so many, I call them turnarounds, where they turn around and shoot you. Uh, they weren't fighting. They were fighting because they were, they were getting so much money as a soldier. It was such a job where they were making a lot of money, but their loyalty wasn't uh, that group. And the head guy was a total thief. I knew that. I, I didn't get along with him at all. I, he left with bags of money in a helicopter, and there were bags of money at the end of the runway. How stupid can Americans be? The, the world doesn't respect us because we're, we've made so many stupid moves. I mean, this guy left with bags of money. And I said he was no good for years. I said he was no good. I met with him a couple of times. They're fine. But uh, that whole thing was collapsing. But they weren't loyal to us. They were loyal to themselves. Good fighters, great fighters, I'll tell you. Among the best, they were actually among, they could take a knife. They were like Rambos. It's like putting a million Rambos. Good old Sylvester Stallone is my friend. But it's like putting a million Rambos. Somebody explained that to me. They're great fighters. It's like putting a Rambo. Give him a knife. And that's all he needs. And by the time he finishes, he'll go down and he slits the throats. With Look at what happened with Russia with them. Look at what happened. So many different... Uh, wars, they fight, they fight tough, but now they have great equipment. And then the other day, it, it sickens you to see it, they have through their boulevard, they have this boulevard, and they're running our equipment through the boulevard, you know, the defeated Americans. We should have left from Bagram, because Bagram is a massive base with hundreds of miles of, you know, surrounding area with nothing there and fencing, and you would have had nobody killed. Instead, a lot of people got killed. We had the 13, but you had hundreds of people who were killed, people, civilians were killed at the same time. So it's a shame. Again, common sense, we have to use common sense. They should have never left. That's like an inner city airport, and it was packed, you couldn't even move, and then a bomb went off and just was uh, so destructive. And so sad because I got to know the parents of uh, the 13 soldiers, most of them, and they're incredible people. They were treated very unfairly. Uh, Biden never called them, Kamala never called them. And then on top of it all, in the debate, she said, we don't, we have no soldiers fighting at all. We have no soldiers. We have soldiers fighting. They were very inside. She had no idea. She has no idea what she's doing. And uh, it's very sad. You know, okay. Ukraine, did you urge Zelensky to be prepared to cede some of Ukraine territory? I didn't say anything because I think it's too soon. I listened. But uh, I think a deal is is there to be had. Absolutely. That's what I do. What I do is I make deals. Do you think that that's what a deal will happen? I think that he will make a deal. And I think, look, it would have been a lot better before because the cities now are all blown up. I mean, they're all blown up except for Kiev. You have the cities are those beautiful golden towers. They're ancient gold. They're all laying on their side, smashed to smithereens, right? Uh, the cities are, many of them are just gone. Do you think they can still it would have been so great. It would have been so great. Number one, it wouldn't have happened. I wouldn't have had to make a deal. Putin never would have gone. I talked to him. It was the apple of his eye. I talked to him a lot about Ukraine. I mean, it was the apple of his eye. You know, he said this used to be a part of the Soviet Union. It used to be a part of Russia. But uh, he had a whole history going. It, it was something he, wanted. he would have never done it. He would have never done it with me there. I mean, I can't speak for the future. Probably would have done it. Eventually, he would have done it because he wanted it. But this was something that was very important to him, but he would have never done it. And, you know, honestly, he never did do it. And there was never even a threat of him doing it. But uh, we'll get, I'll get something done. I know both of them. I know both of them very well. Nearly I talked about what? Early voting in Dane yeah. County today. Nearly half a million Wisconsin voters have received their ballots already. Now they're returning them in the mail, ballot drop boxes. For you to win, uh, I'm curious what you tell voters who are skeptical of that process after they've heard you talk about things like fraud or one-day voting. Well, I think people are going to watch the process a lot closer. Last time we had COVID, people couldn't even get out. You had, you had no security in rooms. Uh, People were afraid to go, even security people, you couldn't get security. It was a terrible thing that happened last time. 
If that didn't happen, we'd have a much different country today. You'd have a much different world today. But last time we had COVID, and to be honest, I mean, you take a look. Take a look at the security. The security was non-existent. No security guard wanted to go out because they didn't want to catch COVID. Big, strong guy, and we say, oh, you'll be great. And then he says, I'm not going out. I don't want to die. And uh, it was a very sad thing. They did a lot of bad things, including not getting legislative approval for some of the things they did. But I think that uh, people are watching this time. We have lots of lawyers watching, and we're doing it early rather than late. We're not going to do it after we're doing early. That's why you see the lawsuits filed. And uh, we're going to try and say uh, too big to rig. You know, we use the expression. Uh, as you get a lot, like uh, Tommy Thompson was telling me, he's never seen such enthusiasm in, in this state, in Wisconsin. A lot of people have told me that, but they, they've told me that in other states too. And typically I poll, you know, we're leading. You saw the polls came out today, we're leading. But typically I poll very low. And then, in other words, people, it's a little, you know, I'm not sure it's the nicest. They say, look, we don't want to tell you. And then they vote for Trump, right? That's why the exit polls were so wrong on number one. They didn't want to say who they're voting for. And then the exit polls reflected that. And then at the end of the evening, I won. But uh, all I want is a fair election. That's all. Just a fair, honest election. I hope we're going to get that. <laughs> this time around? Do I what? Do you trust the process this time around? I'll let you know in about uh, 33 days. No, look, I mean, 33 days. Yeah, go ahead, please. Blue. Thank you. Um, do you Thank you. First of all, do you think Israel should retaliate uh, to these missile attacks from Iran? But also, do you believe that you should have been tougher uh, on Iran after they had launched ballistic missiles in 2020? Uh, on U.S. forces in Iraq, leaving more than 100 uh, U.S. soldiers injured. So, first of all, injured. What does injured mean? Injured means you mean because they had a headache, because the bombs never hit the fort. So just so you understand, uh, there was nobody ever tougher in Iraq. They had no money with me. They would have made any deal with me. I would have had a deal made within, literally, I would have had a deal made within one week after the election. They were dying to make a deal. And when you say not tough, they had no money. They had no money for Hamas. They had no, no money for Hezbollah. And when we hit them, they hit us. And they called us. And they said, we're going to shoot at your fort, but we're not going to hit it. And if you were a truthful reporter, which you're not, you would tell the following. None of those very accurate missiles hit our fort. They all hit outside. And there was nobody heard other than the sound it was loud. And some people said uh, that hurt, and I'm, I accept that. Uh, but uh, they, they told us that they were going to do this and that they weren't going to hurt. And they wanted us to know that because they didn't want us to retaliate. But I essentially bankrupted Iran. They had no money for And it was a big story. There was no money for Hezbollah. There was no money for Hamas. There was no terrorists. We had no terror attacks. And I think I would have ultimately gotten along with, but there was nobody ever that was tougher on Iran than I was. I took their money away, and they would behave. And I, I will say, and I said it many times, what Biden should have done, he should have made a deal with them in that first week because they were dying. They had nothing. They were dying to do it. But they did just the opposite. They took all the sanctions off. I had the sanctions that were the toughest. It's like a lot of people say with Russia, well, I was the one that ended the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. You know that. I think you admit that. I ended it, and then when Biden came in, he approved it. That was the biggest thing ever that Russia's ever done, was the biggest pipeline just about in the world, going to Germany and various places in Europe. And I ended it. And uh, there was nobody tougher on Russia than I was. But uh, with Iran, it's a very sad situation. But uh, we could have made a deal with Iran, and all of this would have never happened. And the reason was I was the toughest by far. Nobody was ever tougher on Iran. But they did. They called us and they told us, we have to retaliate only in the sense that, and they, you know, I think people know this, we have to retaliate, but we're not going to hit anybody. Just keep your people inside the military base. And that's what happened. The rockets hit in all areas. And of the 18 rockets that were launched, six of them, and self-destructed, 12 of them approximately, 12 of them arrived. And when they arrived, very accurate rockets, missiles, 
And when they arrived, they missed the fort. But they had to do that. And uh, I thought it was a very nice thing because they didn't want us to retaliate again. But I was the one that started that. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big deal. You know, look, Americans are already struggling with inflation under yep. Kamala Harris. How does this supply chain issue going to build up and once again be another disastrous economic uh, episode under Kamala Harris? It's massive. It's massive. Those workers are very important to the lifeblood of our country, and it's a massive thing. But don't forget, they've been hurt very badly with inflation. You know, those workers, uh, some people would be upset with them and some people not, but those workers were very badly hit with inflation. And, you know, they're not happy and they do a good job. And uh, they also don't want to see uh, certain new technologies, which in many cases don't work very well. I mean, you know, when they modernize ports, a lot of times it, it doesn't work. There's nobody to talk to. It's very inaccurate. I've heard a lot of complaints about these modernized uh, stations, a lot of very big complaints. But those are, are really hard workers. Uh, I know some of them. And uh, no, it's, that's going to be a tremendous, that's a tremendous hit. There's another one. Biden shouldn't have uh, let that happen. Not that he should have ended it. He should have worked out a deal between them and the others. He could have worked out a deal. That's an easy deal to work out in a sense because you have a certain power of being the, Uni the United States. A lot of these are foreign ship owners. And you have a lot of power being the U.S. And uh, that should have been worked out. Uh, it's a devastating event for the economy. It's also devastating for inflation because everything's going to cost a lot more because of it. I don't know how long it's going to go on, but I understand the workers. Side. I mean, I I see both sides. These workers have been devastated by inflation. And the inflation was caused by energy, stupid energy policies, and equally as much by deadhead spending. And that's what they call it. They call it deadhead spending. You know why? Because stupid people do what they did. And that caused inflation. So they were badly hurt. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. CBS is saying that you have uh, pulled out of a, a planned uh, interview on 60 Minutes. I'd just like to, you to address that report. And if you indeed are not doing the interview, uh, explain your reasoning why. Well, uh, right now I went to, they came to me and would like me to, do an interview, but first I want to get an apology because the last time I did an interview with them, if you remember, they challenged me on the computer. Uh, they said the laptop from hell was from Russia. And I said it wasn't from Russia, it was from Hunter. And I never got an apology, so I'm sort of waiting. I'd love to do 60 Minutes. I do everything. I mean, I do you right now, right? Um, and you're tougher than 60 Minutes, frankly. Uh, the laptop from hell was from Hunter. It wasn't from so I haven't gotten... If you remember Leslie Stahl, we got into a little bit of an argument on the camera talking about that and other things. And, you know, they really owed me an apology. I'll tell you, David Muir, how about David Muir when he said that crime went down? And then the following day, they released the numbers from the Justice Department that crime went up 45 percent. Where's my apology? They should apologize. They were wrong on everything. Uh, so I like to get an apology. So I've asked them for an apology. Let's see if they do it. I wouldn't mind doing uh, 60. I've done 60 Minutes a lot. I did 60 Minutes twice with Mike Wallace, the great Mike Wallace. He was great. His son is from a different ballpark. His son doesn't have... I said, you want to be like your father? Just don't have the talent. Uh, who else, please? Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask you about Milwaukee. Uh, obviously, you're here today in Milwaukee. You were in Dane County. What more do you need to do the, in the next 30 days to win over the voters in these largely Democratic areas? I think we're doing well. You know, we just went to Dane, and we, we had a great time. And uh, the other day, we were, uh, I mean, we had 50,000 people. On, I think it was Saturday, Friday or Saturday. We had 50,000 people, and we had a small venue because uh, the United States government wouldn't allow us to have enough Secret Service people. So we were forced into having like a 1,000-seat venue, and we have 50,000 people, people outside. We wanted to do a rally, an outside rally. And uh, when we drove in, I said, boy, that's a big crowd. And I'm used to the biggest of crowds, and uh, this was a big, beautiful crowd. And 
Uh, Washington would not have let us allow us to have the security that was necessary, the Secret Service that was necessary. And that happened a little bit with respect to today also. You saw all the people. I don't know if anybody was up there, but you saw the people. That, that crowd was massive. But last week, we had a crowd of 50 to 55, 60,000 people. And we had planned an outdoor rally, and it would have been amazing. And uh, Washington would not get us. They said that we have to guard uh, the United Nations, which meant the president of North Korea, who's basically trying to kill me. So they want to guard him, but they don't want to guard me. So we're going to start having it out with them because we've sort of have it. They want to use it. It's like a form of election interference. When they tell you you can't have enough people to guard yourself, I mean, a lot of people show up for what I'm doing. And that's one of the reasons we're going to win. That's like a poll. And we've never had this excitement. Tommy Thompson said it before. We never had the excitement that we have. Now, we've had great excitement. Look, I won it. And the second one, they say lost by 20,000 votes. So sure. But you know what? We did, we did millions of more votes. Everybody does. We did millions and millions more votes the second time. Got the most votes in the history for a sitting president. Sitting president not even, never even came close to that. And we're doing much better. You people report, actually, you people reported it, that we're doing much better today than we did with Hillary or we did the second time. So I think we're going to have some good results here. You spent time in Dane and yes. Milwaukee counties today. In 2020, your campaign sued to throw out the absentee ballots cast by voters in those two counties. What is your message to someone watching in Dane and Milwaukee County who feels they did nothing wrong in 2020? They might support you, but you tried to throw their vote out four years ago. I think they generally agreed with me. My voters generally agreed with me. And I think we have a really good chance of winning it. You know, there are counties that normally a Republican wouldn't win. But if you would see the crowds that we just left, if you'd see the crowds that we had on Saturday, uh, I really think that we're going to win Wisconsin. I think Wisconsin's great. And I'm doing a, a rally in the arena, and I'm doing a rally in Green Bay. And I think we're going to win Wisconsin. I think we might win Wisconsin big. Um, we also, you know, we also have something else that doesn't get reported much, but we have an enthusiasm level that's double or triple what theirs is. The Republicans have, and usually it's the other way around, but we have an enthusiasm level that's uh, substantially more than the Democrats' enthusiasm level. That's a big thing. Yes, please. President, President Trump, President Trump, President Trump uh, the Supreme Court the Thank you. The Supreme Court term begins next week. Yeah. Um, if you were to get another Supreme Court pick, what positions must a judge hold for you to consider them? Honesty, integrity. Uh, we want people that are honest. Uh, we want great integrity. And we want genius. You know, Supreme Court, you have to be very smart. And uh, we don't want to have people that are not brilliant people. And I know many of the justices, and for the most part, I think they're very brilliant people. You want brilliant people, but you want... Great integrity, honesty, and, you know, that's, uh, I don't think it should necessarily be along party lines. It usually tends to be that way, but I don't think it's necessary. I think the main thing is uh, they have to be really uh, respected people. They have to be respected. You have to respect our Supreme Court. I think they get treated very unfairly. You know, you have people that go around uh, trying to play the ref with them, and I know these people, and uh, they're... They're really uh, this gum. They go. They're bad people, and they'll go after not only Supreme Court justices but regular judges, and they'll hit them about, oh, they're not good, they're not smart, they're not. And actually, they're very smart. They're a lot smarter than the people doing the calling out. But they're trying to be Bobby Knight, you know, the great basketball coach who was constantly playing the ref, <laughs> screaming, screaming, screaming. And he said, maybe I won't win this call, but I'll win the next one. And he was off and right. He was a big supporter of mine from Indiana. He was a big supporter of mine, and he was a great, great coach, but he played the ref. Uh, they play the ref by insulting. I, I don't even know, is it legal to do what they do? I mean, they're so outrageous, but a lot of the judges don't stand for it, and the ones that really are respected don't stand for it. They do what's right. Are there certain issues that you would like to see the court take up? 
No, they have to take up whatever they want to take up. I have no, no preference. I, there's certain I'd, there's certain issues I'd love to see taken up, but they have to do what they have to do. They, they have that, I'm sure, very well under control. I think the Supreme Court has really uh, made some very brave decisions over the last year, and I think the. I mean, I'm I'm looking at their approval numbers, and they have approval numbers for everything, but I'm. Looking at their approval numbers go up and up and up. Yeah, please, go ahead, right there. Um, Julia, Dr. Fox, individual. I'm curious, what advice would you give J.D. Vance ahead of his debate tonight? Have fun. <laughs> I said, J.D., have fun. That's true. J.D., that's right. We have, we have a big deal going on. And uh, I said, J.D., have a lot of fun. He's a smart guy. He's, a, uh, he's been amazing. He's been a real warrior. Uh, you know, top student at Yale. He was a... A very brilliant guy in so many different ways. And, you know, he's a very hard worker. He goes around and he's not afraid of the media. He'd stand here and he'd answer all of your questions. I have a lot of people that wouldn't do that. They don't like doing that. They get shouted at and they don't like being shouted at. But uh, J.D. is very much a warrior. Very much a warrior. Thank you very much. On oil prices, Mr. President, on oil prices. Thank you. Iris Tal with NTD here. Um, the crude oil prices rose by over 2% today after the latest Iranian attacks on Israel. Are you concerned about major oil supply disruptions affecting the U.S.? And are you, do you think Americans are prepared for that? And also, secondly, on China, you mentioned China. Do you think China might be trying to seize this moment, to take advantage of this moment, try to plan an attack on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific theater? Thank you so much. Well, you never know with President Xi. Uh, I had a great relationship, as you know, with President Xi. He's a very smart guy. So I don't want to read his mind, uh, but he's very smart and he has a way of doing things that's uh, uh, very good for China. And uh, he's at the top of his game. Our people are not at the top of their game. So you never really know. Uh, I think that uh, China is going to be a very interesting subject over the next couple of years. You know, China's having a lot of problems right now. You know, the economy is having some big problems. They just issued very big stimulus. But uh, it's it's some place, and he's he's a very I mean people get upset when I say it, but he's a very fierce person. He really is. He's a fierce warrior. He's a fierce challenger. But I had a very good relationship with him. Okay, a couple of more. Go ahead, please. Go ahead behind you. Thank you. You've said two can play at that game when talking about the Department of Justice. How would you use the DOJ if you're reelected? Well, I think it's terrible what they've done. They've weaponized government to an extent that nobody's ever seen before. Uh, it's, it's done in third world countries, banana republics. But, I mean, like as an example, they said, oh, the documents case, the documents case. Well, he was guilty. They basically said he's guilty, but he's incompetent. He's allowed to be president, but he's not allowed to go to court. It was a strange ruling. But I was exonerated from my case. That was a big case, as you know. Down in Florida, we had a... I don't know the judge, but a brilliant judge, totally brilliant judge. And I was exonerated and fully exonerated. And uh, I can only say this, that, uh, you know, when I, when I stand here and I watch uh, the questions being asked by people that are somewhat hostile, uh, many people that are fair, I mean, you have a lot of different talents, a lot of different talents in this room. Uh, I was just thinking to myself, I, I really, all I want to see is fairness. Our country needs you so badly, the media. You're like the policemen and women of, of the world. You're so important. You keep politicians honest. You keep politicians from doing really bad things. You're so important. And it's so important that the media be fair and, and really improve. Because I, I watch how unfair it is and how one-sided it is. And you need the media to really buck up in this country because nobody's ever seen anything like it. And I can tell you, I don't want any favors. I just want fairness. I want like a level playing field. And if we can get the media back to a level playing field, that's going to do a lot for the good of our country because we have to make a comeback. Our country is a failing nation. This is a failing nation. We're failing at the borders. We're failing at everything we're doing. You look at the numbers. We lost $2 trillion this year. Two trillion. You know, people don't report that. Our country, we have a deficit of two trillion dollars. It was never a deficit in the history of the world like that. And one of the reasons I'm going to bring Elon Musk into 
negotiate a lot of that. He's very good at it, and he's a great guy, and he loves the country. He really loves the country. It's not easy for him to do an endorsement. You know, he does, he endorsed me. But, Brian, I would say it's not easy for him to do an endorsement, right? He's got a lot of different factions, a lot of different sides. But he wants to save the country. And, uh, you know, I tell you the airplane story. I could tell you 20 other stories just like it. Uh, we have to we have to be a lot different. We have to run a lot different. We are a failing nation, but we're not going to be a failing nation for long, I predict. We're going to have a, I hope we're going to have a great victory, a big victory, and then we're going to straighten out our country. We're going to seal up our borders, and we're going to let a lot of people into our country, but they're going to come in legally. We had Remain in Mexico, and for some reason he voided that immediately, and she did. I guess she did because she was in charge of the border. And I hate to see that when somebody was so bad at the border and then tries to pretend like she wasn't even involved. This was the worst border in the history of the world, not here. The history of the world. There's never been a border like that. Third, I always say third world countries would have used sticks and stones to keep people out if that happened to them. There's never been anything like it. And the press doesn't want to report about it. And they've got to report about it. It's a big story. To me, it's the biggest story. When you allow 13,000 murderers into our country, and they're free to kill. They're free to kill. These are people that are rough, tough, horrible people. It's not going to be a positive thing. When you allow thousands of terrorists from very tough countries into our country, they're here. We don't even know who they are. We know they're terrorists, and we know something about some of them. But generally, we don't. But we know there are thousands of terrorists led into our country. Drug dealers are in our country at levels we've never seen before. Uh, we're really, uh, you know, we're a very sick country, but we're going to figure it out and we're going to get it fixed. Yeah, no, go ahead. You've got one of the biggest, I predict you have one of the biggest rallies coming up on Saturday in Butler, yeah. attendance-wise. Can you give me a preview of that and what's going through your mind going back to Butler? Butler, uh, that's right, it's going to be on Saturday. And... It's going to be an amazing rally. You know, Butler has become quite a famous place. It's like a monument now. People ride through the streets of Butler looking at, as though it were a monument. It's a very important. We lost a great person, Corey the fireman, and two other people were supposedly going to die, and they ended up living because of great doctors up there. These doctors, two separate doctors, uh, one was just hit badly, and the other was hit really badly. They were both... Uh, when I said, first thing I said is, how many people are, are dead? Because, you know, we had a massive crowd as far as the eye could see. And there was no empty areas. So when bullets are fired, they're going to hit people. And these are AR-15 bullets. They go, they were going over my head. I heard them. I didn't know you could hear bullets, but they are, they are 4,000 miles an hour or something. And they're going over my head. Um, and I was amazed that they just said, three. they said, Probably three dead. That was my only, uh, and then two of the three. And I'm very happy to report the, uh, a friend of mine, some people have heard this, but he said, I'd like to make a contribution. Uh, these people live good. They, there's no crime there. There's, you know, it's beautiful in many ways, but not a lot of money. And uh, they had a great relationship. Corey and his wife was really nice. And two daughters. He he uh, was killed jumping on top of the daughters. He didn't want the daughters to be hit. And when he jumped on top, he got hit. He got hit really badly. There was a uh, National Guardsman that was seated nine seats away. And we're going to give him something for what he did. Uh, Corey was hit in the head, bleeding profusely. And this National Guardsman went over to Corey, saw that he was still living, and gave a mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And nobody's ever seen anything like it. And it was tough. And then Corey died. But for that man to do that was amazing, actually. So, you know, I'm very pleased to report. So a friend of mine, rich guy, a member of Mar-a-Lago, said, I'd like to uh, make a contribution to the family of, of Corey, the firefighter. And I said, well, that would be nice. And I, I said, where is it? He gives me a check, and it was for a million dollars. I gave it to Corey's wife, a million dollars. But bigger than that, we, we did a GoFundMe, and I think we picked up about $6 million, and we're giving her 
I guess about four. She'll end up with about five million dollars. And she said to me, I'd rather have my husband. I understood that it was such a beautiful thing to say. But she said, I'd rather have my husband. Now, she, they never saw a million or five million. You know, this is a tremendous amount of money for them. Uh, and the other gentlemen are getting more than a million dollars a piece. And we went out to, uh, we went out, and that was the public. I mean, it's amazing. So we're going to be there on Saturday. It's going to be a really big event, and it's going to be something. Uh, we'll celebrate the life of Corey, I think. And I want to celebrate the, the two gentlemen that got hit really bad. I mean, you know, it's... But and we should celebrate their doctors. Who would think you go up into sort of the country, right? The country, and you have two doctors that took two men that were so badly wounded, and they saved their lives, right? And just very talented people. There are a lot of talented people in our country. So that'll be exciting. And the question is, how am I going to start the speech? And I, I think I was going to say, as I was saying, because uh, that's about where I was. I was very early, and if I didn't have that chart, which I always bring up, I rarely bring it up, but when I do, it's always at the end of the speech, and it's on my left, and here it was the first moment of the speech, and it was on my right. Had I not made that turn, I would not be speaking to you people today, and some of you would be extremely happy about that, I suspect. But I want to thank you all, and uh, I'm now going to Texas, going to Houston, and we have some big things there, and uh, we're traveling. I think I'm booked every single day for 33 days. And as you probably have heard, I've worked for 17 or 18 days, wouldn't you say, in a row? And I'm working even when I'm not working. But we're we're doing a lot of things. We made a lot of a lot of different speeches. We'll do. We're starting up the rallies again, very big. And we have more enthusiasm than we've ever had. And all we want to do is very simple. We want to make America great again. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Simply amazing. I don't know where this guy gets the energy. I know some of you guys are like, oh, he looks tired. He's not looking tired. It wasn't a rally. It was a speech. It was a press conference. Uh, simply amazing. He just said he's going to have like, what? How many events up until November 5th? <sighs> Honey, going to have to get me some like a, ca a cappuccino machine here or an espresso machine. I don't even drink coffee. This is nuts. Uh, we got another one coming up in about uh, 30 minutes. I had to push back to 8 o'clock to 8.30 to give me time to get everything ready for the debate. So I'm going to jump. I'm just going to blanket say everybody who donated in the chat with your super chats. Thank you very, very, very much. Sorry we're short for time. We've got to get ready for the big debate. It starts at, I'm going to go live at 8.30. So it's a... Uh, just about 8 o'clock right now. I'm going to shut this down. Baby, basically go to the bathroom, get something to eat, chop it up, and get everything back set up. And then we're going to go live at 8.30. I'm going to have the link. <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. We're going to have the link, everything ready to talk about the, the gift prizes and everything else. So, um, thank you for tuning in. I didn't know he was going to go for two and a half. I didn't even know if he was going to get there. We didn't even know if this event was going to happen. It obviously did. Um, make sure, make sure, make sure that you go ahead and check out the link for this event. It's on my page. Go ahead and register to, uh, not register, but go ahead and hit your notification. Get in there. It's 7.56. I will go live at 8.30. Um, thank you all for tuning in. It was awesome. We'll talk about it as soon as we as soon as we get back up and running for the 8:30 show. Third show of the day.